Whew, it's good to be together. Hey, turn to somebody next to you and say, Jesus loves you. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I'm a big fan of... Um, Korean football, Korean national football, the real football, right? Yeah, <laughs> soccer, okay, football, yeah, football. And I don't know if you guys all, any of you are interested in, in Korean national team, but recently they've been going through a really hard time. They, they, they lost at the semifinals at the Asian Cup. Anybody, anybody, right? And apparently the night before the semifinals, there's, there's a reason why they lost. The night before the semifinals, they had a big fight among the, the, the team members. Apparently, one of the up and rising new stars, Kang In Lee, right? He got into a fist fight with his captain, the almighty Son Heung Min, right? Sonny, right? He's not only the captain of the Korean national team, he's the captain of Tottenham Hotspur in, in, the, in, in the English Premier League, right? And, and right now, it's, it's pretty, things are pretty like tough for Kang In because, like, you know, everyone thought he was, like, cute, and he's really good, and he's, like, the next one. And then, man, they found out something new about this kid, and he's getting some pretty heated, like, criticism all over the world, right? Because Sonny is such a, such an, you know, a, a character in, in the soccer, or the, I'm not, sorry, football world, right? And so th that's, that's all going on. And I feel like we, we often do that, though, right? We often construct our own image of a person, and then we kind of uh, discover new things about this person, and at times we get very disappointed, right? I'm like, whoa, I didn't know that. Or sometimes we're pleasantly surprised, right? Wow, I, maybe I didn't have such a good image, but man, th this person has these kind of qualities, right? And I think sometimes uh, <laughs> we would rather not know the reality, right? Not come close, right? I just want to stay in my beautiful image of what I know about this person, right? Don't tell me anything, right? And Especially with your favorite celebrities, anybody, right? Like, don't, don't, don't tell me anything. Let me live in this wonderland, right? And so my question is, how is it when it comes to Jesus, right? When you think about Jesus, what, what, what comes to your mind? What's your image of, of Jesus, right? What about his character stands out to you? What are the things that you really know about him that are true about him? And I think, you know, generally, I don't know about you, but the, the, the general imagery that we have about Jesus is, is compassion, right? It's, it's kindness. It's merciful. I mean, he's, he's the Lamb of God, right, that, that, that died obediently on that cross. He's sacrificial and, and he's tender, right? He loves sinners. He's merciful. He's wise and all these things. But today, uh, we encounter a, a little bit of a different side of Jesus, right? Kind of a new characteristic that we're not typically like used to hearing a lot about or paying attention a lot to. And, and so we're going to pay attention to this scripture today, okay, to what Jesus does in today's scripture. And, and, and I want us to approach it with fresh eyes, right? And, and I wonder what it would cause us to feel. Maybe it will cause us to fear this, you know, kind of like a pleasant surprise, right? Wow, wow this is awesome. And you want to draw closer to him. Or maybe it will shock you a little bit, right? I don't know where it will lead you, but... Let's, let's open up our hearts, right, and, and um, try to discover the real Jesus, right, the real Jesus, and especially this different side of him that we, uh, we might often neglect. You guys ready? Todos listos? All right. Open up to John chapter 2, right? It says the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. What's the Passover, anybody? It's one of the biggest feasts in, in the Jewish, you know, world. What, what is it? They're remembering and celebrating the time when? Yes, thank you. Whew, okay. When God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, right? So this was a time where every, every faithful Jew and their family would travel from all different places to Jerusalem, right? Uh, to, to worship there, to encounter God there and, and, and you know, to, to sacrifice, right? And to observe this Passover feast. Now, the problem was, though, many of them were traveling from faraway places. So naturally what happened is it was very difficult for them to, to travel with the ox or whatever they were going to sacrifice. So naturally what happened is outside, right, in the city of Jerusalem, 
right, from the gates of Jerusalem all the way, like, leading the roads up to the temple, these, you know, merchants started occurring, right? They would sell these animals that were going to be used for sacrifice. And it was a good thing, right? It was a good thing to serve people so they could, you know, everyone can come and, and actually worship God, right? But the problem is, you know, we all know that uh, location is everything in business. Can we get an amen, right, right? So, so what happens, right? Slowly, slowly, right? <laughs> more and more shops open up near the temple, right, on the hot spots, and then by the time of, of, of Jesus, when he, he's around on this earth, right, in that area, <laughs> the merchants actually, these shops were not only outside in the city, they were within the temple ground, okay? And so I, I just want to, to kind of you to pay attention to that. So in verse 14, Passover, they're all coming. Jesus is all coming with his disciples. And verse 14 says, in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons or doves, right? And the money changers sitting there. What were these money changers? Again, people were coming from all different places and they used different currencies, right? And so they had to come. And the temple only received that pure currency that they used, right? So they had to change it. And, you know, the exchangers got a little percentage, right? A little fee off of that. And so they were doing that. So it was trying to help people. But, but again, highlight the location, the space of where it was happening, right? It was in the temple grounds where people were <laughs> meant to pray and hear the voice of God and worship and encounter him, right? And when, when Jesus uh, saw that, what did he do? Making a whip of cords. He probably got together, you know, some ropes that were tying the animals or whatever. You know, I don't think he prepared whips from home that day, right? But he, was, he went there, right? He put together some of these things and he drove them all out of the temple. Like, what? Right? Like, you can hear these sounds, right? The ox hitting the ox and kicking them out and the sheep and all of that. And then he pours out the coins, right? When I asked my son, what does that look like? He's like, he was gentle. He like poured it out. You know, I'm like, no, I don't think so, Aiden. He, he, it says he flipped the tables. He was pouring the coins, right, of the money changers and overturned their tables. Again, highlight on where it was happening, right? All of these activities in itself was reasonable and understandable, but where it was happening, right, the place that was meant to worship God. And by the way, this was not the first time that Jesus came to the temple. You guys all remember, even as a 12-year-old boy, remember when his whole family came, right, to the temple? They forgot about him. And like a couple of days later, they're like, where is Jesus? And they had to come back. And Jesus was left there in the temple. You guys remember that? Uh, you know, uh, talking with the elders and all of that stuff. So he would come regularly, actually, with his, with his family as a faithful Jewish family. But this time, he was ready to take action publicly, right, part of his the beginning of his public ministry here. He was to, act, to take action about what he had been seeing and what he's been observing all along. How his father's house that was meant to worship God, to, to, to encounter him, right? That intimate place where the, the sound that you were supposed to hear was prayer. People murmuring and, and pouring their guts and hearts out and encountering him. But instead of that, all of the sounds of prayer was smothered by what? Meh! Ah! Ten, ten cents cheaper, come over here, get this cheap. You know what I'm talking about? Like everything was smothered by that, and that's the sound they were hearing. And, and no wonder Jesus was zealous about it, right? He was in, indignant about this, this, you know, diluting of, of God's purposes of, of having the temple. Instead of the pure worship and, and people actually considering helping others encounter God, it was all about greed and benefits and you know, it was a big mess. And so, it's a shocking scene here, right? Put yourself, <laughs> when I put myself in the, in, the, in the sandals of the disciples, right? right? They, were, they were following Jesus and like he just turned a water into wine and like, oh, he's wise, he's gentle, he's kind. And then I, I feel like they would have been shocked a little bit, right? It's like a little bit startled, right? I'm like, whoa. You know, they probably were observing him and he was like watching and probably some kind of, I don't know, anger kind of like, you know, and, and he, he deliberately doing all these things. I, I feel like they would have had a, a, a mixture of emotions, right? Maybe part of us, right, even as you observe, I don't know what you feel, but part of me, I'm like, wow, Jesus is bold. Come on, he's, he's cool. You know what I mean? Like he's 
how, oh, oh, charisma. You know what I mean? Like, ha, ha, right? But then at the, uh, there's another side where I'm like, I'm a little terrified, you know? What is he doing? I mean, like, are we going to get in trouble? Uh-oh, look at them. The leaders are coming. Uh-oh, you know, this is dangerous. Ah, what's going on? Like, is this safe? I mean, <laughs> what's going on here? And they probably kind of had that mixture and, and curiosity and a little bit of, like, being startled, right? And so it continues with, within that scene, verse 16. It says, and he told those who sold the pigeons, particularly, I'm going to explain more on this, the doves, right? Take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of trade. Ah, I don't know what his voice sounded like, but it was probably like, you know. His disciples remember that it was written, right? This is a quote from the Old Testament in the Psalms. Zeal for your house will consume me. So they saw a passionate, angry, strong side of Jesus. So, so what's going on here, guys? What's going on? Was Jesus angry? Did he have a moment of pure outrage? An explosion of wrath and anger that kind of went out of control, right? Yes? In one sense, definitely yes. He was angry. Can we get an amen, right? Let's, let's not pretend. He wasn't smiling. You know what I mean? Like, he was furious. He was indignant about what was going on, right? He had what's called righteous indignation. Jesus felt it in his heart, right? And oftentimes, guys, we think anger is all bad. But the truth is what? Anger is actually the correct response to injustice. And we are naturally opposed to injustice because we're created in the image of God, right? There's something innate in us that when something's evil and wicked and unjust, like, it should cause anger in us. If it doesn't, that's, that's weird. That's something off, that is more off there, right? There is such a thing as righteous anger. Right? And this is the definition of it. Shall we read it together? One, two, three, go. Righteous anger consists of getting angry at the things that anger God. And then seeking a proper remedy to correct the wrong. If you're in GBG, Good and Beautiful God, it's, this is coming up in, under the title of God is Holy, right? This definition is important. I want you to remember this because I'm going to come back to this, right? It's, it's getting angry at the things that are unjust, that, that, things that anger God as well, right? And then seeking a proper remedy to correct that wrong. Even in Ephesians chapter 4, it says this. Ephesians chapter 4, it says this. If you, yes, okay, it says, be angry and do not sin. What does that tell you? You can actually be angry and not sin. But it does tell you the danger how, of, of how anger can lead into sin, uh, lead into anger. Sinful things very easily, right? So it says, don't let the sun go down. Don't harbor it. Don't let it grow within you, right? Because often that becomes an opportunity or space or tapas, a room for the devil to come in, right? If you remain in that angry place, many times it grows into resentment, bitterness, despair, revenge, even violence, right? Or outrage, as you would. But again, anger in itself is, is not a sin, clearly, right? Even in Psalm 97, verse 10, it says this. Let's read this together. One, two, three. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. It says hate evil. Right? Be angry about what is unjust. Hate is a pretty strong word. But we should rightly feel hatred towards what is unjust, towards what is not well and good, right? And so Jesus is angry in that way. So Je but Jesus was not having a moment of rage that was out of control, though. You guys all getting that? He wasn't having a moment where his emotions just took over, his eyes flipped, you know, and he's just out of control in this, like, oh, raging way, right? Like where, where you know, an, uh, an abusive alcoholic dad throws something and, you know, it's not that kind of a scene, though. He did what he did, listen up, he did what he did with utmost intentionality and meaning, actually, right? In other words, what he did here was a deliberate choice of action to actually proclaim very important truths about who he was and what he was coming to do, actually. Right? And what are those important truths that he was trying to demonstrate deliberately through those chosen actions that he took? Right? In other words, how do we know that Jesus' anger was deliberate and intentional and not this out-of-control you know, a sinful kind of rage that we are often used to. You can discover uh, that through looking at the remaining conversation, actually, as it goes, right? 
Uh, so we're able to see his utmost intentionality. So in verse 18, right after that happens, the Jews come. The leaders are walking to him and they, and they challenge him and, and say, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Which is a fascinating question. I've been sitting with this question for the last three days and I realized I'm going to prepare a whole other sermon just on this question two weeks from now, okay? About how self-deceived these people. Because get this, guys. They, it's, it's obvious that these leaders, the Jewish leaders, know that they're wrong. Because they don't come to ask, what are you doing? They, they know that they're wrong. They come not asking, what are you doing? Because they know what he's doing is right. They know deep inside, like, what they're doing is messed up. What they're doing is, like, against God's truer heart. And they can, they can tell that, whoa, what Jesus is doing is kind of... I think it's kind of right, you know what I mean? Like, but they're, they're not going to admit it, right? They're not going to say, oh. So instead of challenging what he's doing, they come and they ask him what? What sign do you show us for the, he's, he's challenging who he is. You know, what is that question? He's asking them, he's asking Jesus, who do you think you are? What, by what authority, what kind of power or backing do you come to do this? Who are you to do this, right? Against us, the established, religious, social, political leaders of our place. You know what I mean? Like, they're, they're, they're going at it in that way. And in response to that, in verse 19, Jesus answers them. Again, they're asking a question at level one, one dimension. Jesus goes like four dimension, right, in his answer. He says, destroy. Here, so they ask him for a sign. And Jesus says, here, here it is. Here is a sign that I'll show you. What is it? He says this. Destroy this temple, right? And in three days, I will raise it up. And obviously, the Jewish leaders are thinking about the physical temple that they can see, the rocks and everything that was built there. And so they say, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And, we'll, and, you, and, and what? You're going to raise it up in three days, right? It didn't make any sense. And it's, it's kind of obvious that even to the disciples, the Jewish leaders, and everyone who were, who were, who were there, it, it, what Jesus said just kind of went over, flew over their heads, right? They were, the only thing they can think about was the physical temple. But what was he thinking about? In verse 21 it says, but he was speaking about what? The temple of his body, right? He was coming to say what? I'm the ultimate temple of God. I am the presence of God. I am God. And you know what? He was talking about what? He was promising, of, prophesying about what was about to happen, right? His body was going to be crucified. And in three days, he was going to be raised. He was telling them, this is going to be the ultimate sign. And it says in verse 22, when therefore he was raised. So after he was resurrected, the disciples remembered, right? They're like, oh. <gasps> You remember that day when we went to the temple and that happened? You remember what he said? Remember what he said? He said something strange like about the temple and raising it back in three days. We had no idea what he was talking about. But after, three years later when he was risen from the dead, they remember that he had said this. And they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Come on, this is good stuff. Can I get an amen, right? right? And so... Let me point out four things here, right? That, that how do we know that Jesus was deliberate and intentional? Four things that stand out here. First of all, Jesus is deliberately, by the way, guys, I'm using for the first time on PowerPoint animation. Yeah. This is a skill called appearing, making things appear, okay? I'm so proud of myself. Okay. Jesus is, deli Jesus is deliberately prophesying about his coming crucifixion and resurrection. That's how we know. He's not out of control. Like, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he's able to point to what he's ultimately going to do. Can we get an amen, right? right? He's pointing to that ultimate sign. Secondly, what stands out? Wow, right? Jesus, <laughs> I'm just about 30 years late here, okay? Jesus is deliberately demonstrating that what? He is the Lord of all. That he is the ultimate temple. He is the very presence of God. In other, as a matter of fact, he is, he is God. He is the great I am, right? He's declaring that, right? And you guys have to understand, the temple was at the center of not only the spiritual religious aspect of, of that world, but political social, that, that was it. And so when he's coming and proclaiming judgment and uh, upon, you know, the wrongdoings of that system and that whole place, 
What he's doing is he's proclaiming his lordship over that all. This all comes from me. I am the temple, guys, right? I am the Lord. This all must bow. And so what's being declared is his authority to actually judge as well, right? He's the creator, and he's also the judge. And God's the only one who knows everything about every, everyone and everyone's heart. And so he's the only righteous judge, right? And that's exactly, again, right, what the Jewish leaders question him about. By what authority are you coming? And he's, he's definitely declaring, by the authority of the great I am, the, the ultimate temple, the God, I am Lord, right? And he's making it clear, I am authority over all. I am the temple. <laughs> what stands out? Third, third stands out. Wow, okay. Jesus is deliberately, it's like magic, guys. It's like magic. Jesus is deliberately fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, right? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, this is what it says. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. This is Elijah in the Old Testament, and this is who in the New Testament? The one that prepared the way of Jesus? John the Baptist. And then it says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Can we get an amen, right? He suddenly appears in this temple. And if you read the remainder of Malachi chapter 3, it's talking about this coming Messiah, Lord, that's going to suddenly come into the temple. And he's going to purify the people of God, actually. He's, and he's also going to call them to repent. And he's going to save and redeem and purify and purge all who are fallen for those who receive and repent. Yet, those who reject him, it also pronounces judgment over them. So this chapter 3 Jesus is fulfilling here by suddenly appearing in the temple, and he's proclaiming judgment as much as salvation together, right? And you see both of that happening there. To all who would heed his, his calling, right? To all who would listen and repent and change their way and bow down before the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, he comes as a beautiful Savior. But at the same time, for those who do not heed that call, Judgment is a real thing, right? Because I'm getting ahead of myself, but he's, he's, he's not only Savior, but he's, he's judge. He's Savior and judge. And that's what we see him declaring through what he's doing here, through fulfilling Malachi 3, coming into this temple. Fourthly, what stands out? Jesus is deliberately caring for the poor and outcasts. You guys... Which, which sellers did he particularly talk to? Anybody remember? We just read it a few minutes earlier. The ones who were selling the ox, the sheep, the what? The doves, the pigeons. Guys, what does that tell us? Right? Not everyone had the same financial status. People who had more would offer more expensive things like an ox, like a sheep. But people who are less economically, right, they, they, they were... God gave them a provision, right, to offer birds, these doves, these pigeons. So he was looking out, particularly for the poor, but also where was this happening within the temple? It was in the temple, but what area of the temple? It was the outer courts. Everybody say outer courts. That's where who worshipped? That's where the Gentiles worshipped. These outcasts, these people that were looked, as, looked at as lesser, right, less holier. The disadvantaged, the outcast. So isn't this crazy? In the midst of the, the wrath and the judgment and ah, that Jesus was doing there, you, you know that it was deliberate because he was caring for the poor. He was caring for the Gentiles. He was caring for the least of these, right? The less fortunate. So, so bringing that together, we can clearly see that Jesus didn't have a moment of losing his temper. He's intentionally proclaiming his authority. Can we get an amen, right? Calling out what was wrong and wicked. All the abuse, the greed, the, the, the losing of the true heart of worship and obedience to God, right? True religion, which is caring for the poor and the widowed and the outcasts, right? Who's lost this true love for the Lord. So Jesus was coming, declaring intentionally through what he was doing. So here's the question of the day. Is Jesus safe? Turn to somebody next to you and ask that question. Is Jesus safe? Is Jesus safe? I think he is, right? He's the most tender, loving, patient, merciful being who forgives, 
who takes upon himself our sins and dies for us. I mean, he is our loving Savior. Can we, can we get a hallelujah for that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is the most safe, loving, tender person. However, he's also a righteous judge. You can be assured that Jesus' heart is indignant about evil and wickedness in this world and even in our lives. It breaks his heart with such deep anguish and pain, right? He's passionate about removing sin and wickedness because he's good and holy, but because also he loves us, right? And he doesn't want us to be ruined in sin. And so through proclaiming correction and judgment in this temple like he is, he's actually what? He's calling them to repentance, actually. He's saying, hey, man, this is wrong. And he wants to cleanse and purify. And being corrected and being called to repentance can hurt. Everybody say, ouch. Right? <laughs> it can hurt, but it's for our good, isn't it? Right? And get this, we have a choice. We have a choice. The Bible says God is a consuming fire. And there's only two ways you're going to experience the fire, the consuming fire of God. First, if you heed his calling and you receive and repent and bow before his authority and, and ask for help and mercy that I can't fix myself, I'm, I'm, I'm torn here, I'm broken, then you will experience that consuming fire coming to purify you, transforming you, making you whole again, right? Because he's merciful, he loves you, that's what he wants for you. But if we don't repent and receive, if we reject, there's also consequence. We will experience the consuming fire of God in a very different way, actually. The wrath of Jesus is real. And, and, and trust me, you want God to be good in that way. Wouldn't it be horrible to have a God that's wishy-washy and compromising and, oh, it's okay. No, like you want God to be just. You want him to, to hate what is evil. And just to clarify, wrath is actually not a part of his essential nature. His love and holiness is, right? But because he is holy and good and just and loving, when there is sin, wrath is necessary, right? Wrath is necessary. Now, when the new heavens and new earth comes, no more sin, there will be no more wrath. So that's what we mean. Wrath is not an essential, like, we're not going to have a wrathful God in all eternity, right? It's going to be all done away with. Because, but he, because he is loving and good, wrath is necessary. And so all of this comes together very beautifully in the person of Jesus, right? These complex, diverse attributes of God come together very beautiful in the person of Jesus. You guys, coming back, right? You guys remember the definition of uh, righteous anger? Anybody? Say it out loud. To be angry about? Yeah, things that anger God. And then what? Seeking a proper remedy, right? To correct that wrong. Now, what's fascinating is, remember when, when the disciples of Jesus, they see Jesus' zealousness in the temple, they're reminded about a, a passage from the Old Testament. That's actually from Psalm 69, particularly verse 9, right? And, and it says this, right? For, for zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. You guys remember that, right? We just read it. If you read the whole psalm, it's, it's powerful. It's a psalm of a suffering servant, actually. It's a psalm, and the psalmist is saying, I've been so faithful to you, but because of my devotion and obedience, somehow it has led to suffering and much turmoil. And isn't that so fitting, Right? Of, of what Jesus did for us, right? In other words, he comes as this righteous judge to the temple and he says, uh, I'm authority over this, right? I have 
the authority, right, to save and to heal and to judge. I am that, and, and he's proclaiming judgment over it. But what does he do right after that? He doesn't change them or force them or anything like that. He actually, after three years, what does he do? Just like he, he's promised. So he's angry and ferocious about what is wrong, right? What angers the heart of God. But he finds the remedy, the appropriate remedy to fix that. And what is it? It's himself to go to the cross. Instead of forcing people to obey, he, he, he woos them with his love. He goes to the cross and says, I love you. I want you back. I don't want you there, right? And he becomes a sacrificial, loving sacrifice for those who are against him, actually. Trying to woo them back with his compassion. And it's fascinating how these two seemingly contradictory characteristics come together in Jesus, right? He's this judge who's, you know, angry and ferocious about sin and wickedness. But he actually, that same God comes to the lowest of lows and cursed on a tree for, for those sinners that, that don't deserve. This is the beauty of our Lord Jesus. He is the lamb, but he's also the lion. My brother uh, Joshua uh, started out with Revelation, but I have it here. Revelations 5, 5, 6. This is what it says, right? At the end of history, this is what we're going to see. And in verse 5, it says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered, right? So that he can open the scroll and seven seals. But right after that in verse 6, And then between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a? Lamb, right? If, if, if we're flowing well, we're supposed to see a lion again, <laughs> right? You just talked about a lion, but suddenly they see a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Does that sound like the cross to you, right? With seven horns, and the horns are authority. It's power, right? It's respect and might. With seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. There's a lot of symbolism, right, in the, in the, in the book of Revelation. But you see here, he appears both as lion who judges who has authority, who has power. But he's also a lamb that was slain. But again, that lamb has horns and he's authoritative, right? And so you, you basically Jesus, our God, is a lion-like lamb and a lamb-like lion, right? He's both. He's together. He's beautiful in that way. The next chapter in chapter 6, verse 16, says, Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the what of, of the lamb? Isn't that weird? It makes more sense if it's the wrath of the lion, you know what I mean? Rawr. The wrath of the lamb, meh. you know what I mean? That's, that's kind of weird. But that's our Jesus, you know what I mean? Like, the wrath of the lamb. Like, what's, what's the lamb going to do? But he's a lamb-like lion and lion-like lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Who can stand? Again, in Revelation 17, 14. Shall we read this together? One, one, two, three, go. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. So today's ministry of Jesus in the temple, and all of these things today, right? He's declaring that He's Savior, and also he's judge. Jesus brings salvation and also judgment. Did you know the gospel is always two sides to it? It's a message of salvation for some, yet to others it is a message of death. And 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says this. Right? Paul, and he's talking about himself as a gospel messenger and the gospel that he's preaching, right? For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And in verse 16 it says, to one, a fragrance from death to death. To other, we are a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Jesus is the lamb that was slain for us our beautiful, merciful, compassionate Savior who would lay down everything for our sake. But one day Jesus will also return, and he will return as the Lion of Judah. 
He'll return as Lord and King, as righteous judge. And let me tell you, he has the right to judge. The lamb like lion, the lion like lamb is going to come. This is what John Piper, here's another, here's another magical moment here. John Piper, he says, this glorious conjunction shines all the brighter because it corresponds perfectly with our personal weariness and our longing for greatness. Isn't that true? Deep inside, we know we're weary, we're broken, and we need the compassion of Jesus and his salvation. But at the same time, it's not just that. We also know that, you know, we're, we're part of something greater and, and, you know, something bigger and right and righteous. And so we long for our God to be awesome, to be glorious in that way, to be strong. Jonathan Edwards, right, one of the greatest theologian, they say, of, of American history, <laughs> said this. What makes Christ so glorious is an admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies. The tender compassion of Jesus and the mighty righteousness of, of him as well, right? Coming together. Joshua stole my, 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 my uh, thing here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm totally kidding. Yeah. Well, yeah, there, there, if, you, if you guys know uh, the, the Chronicles of Narnia and, and, and the, um, the, the, what is, what is it, the, the, the lion, the witch, the wardrobe, there's a scene where the, the sons of man come to Narnia land, right? And they're, they're hanging out with Mr. Beaver, right, the Mr., Mr. and Mrs. Beaver right there, and they're having a conversation, and the sons of man have no idea who Aslan is, who, who Aslan is, is, is Jesus, right, in, in, this, in this novel, right? And they're having a conversation, and they're like, what, he wasn't a man? He's a lion? Yeah. And then, is it Susan, right, who, who asks um, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, is he quite safe, right? Is he quite safe? And in response to that question, right, because you, you realize they were coming to Narnia land and who Jesus is, who Aslan is with their own conception, with their own image, so they, they actually don't know him. And Mr. and Mr. Be uh, Mrs. <laughs> Beaver explains it to them. And they say, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. He's a lion. There's more to this, right? He's a lion. Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. And he's king. Right? That's what they said. Let me challenge you with this, right? Um, Jesus cannot be nicely put into your religious box. He isn't some, someone or something you can just place as an important part of your life. He's not someone who you can tame and keep under your authority and control. You're mistaken if you think that way about Jesus. I think our problem and devastating critical mistake is that we create our own versions of Jesus. We're masters of idolatry. We recreate a Jesus that fits our own little beliefs and values. We try to twist and shape Jesus to fit our likings and what we feel is right. If Jesus doesn't challenge your beliefs, listen up. If Jesus does not challenge your beliefs, then you might not have a genuine belief and relationship with the real Jesus. Jesus isn't comfortable. Jesus isn't safe. Jesus isn't convenient. Jesus isn't a doormat. Jesus isn't your genie in a lamp. And if your Jesus looks exactly like you, then you probably aren't worshiping Jesus. You're worshiping yourself. Right? When's the last time Jesus challenged you about something in your life? When's the last time you sat with Jesus? And it felt so disturbing, like he was flipping tables and pouring coins. When did it last feel like he was making a cord of whip and going at it? Do you believe the real Jesus? Let's pray together.